It's time to be equipped with spiritual battle. Defending the Faith is a show to train Christians worldwide to be effective teachers and speakers on the subject of biblical creation so that the next generation can stand firm on the biblical truth and defend their faith. Now here is your host of Defending the Faith, Mike Riddle. Welcome to Defending the Faith. I'm your host, Mike Riddle. Again, our show is about training people on the issues of creation, evolution, and biblical apologetics. As we love to train people how to defend your faith in God's Word. Now, we have a ministry called Creation Training Initiative, or simply CTI, and you can find us on the web at creationtraining.org. We also like to hear from our listeners out there. If you have any comments about our show, or if you have any questions you'd like answered about creation or evolutionists, you can email us at info, that's I-N-F-O, at creationtraining.org. Info at creationtraining.org. We'd love to hear from you, and especially the questions you might have. Now, our topic today. We're going to continue where we were last week, handling objections to a literal six-day creation. We'll call this part two. In previous sessions, we discussed how to interpret God's Word, a method for doing that. It was called hermeneutics, and we talked about the methods of hermeneutics. We talked about the days of creation, why they were literal days and not long ages. Then last session, we covered two objections to a literal six-day creation. We talked about the day-age theory and the gap theory, and we saw both cases, they were biblically wrong. Now, in this session, we're going to cover several more topics that people use to deny a literal six-day creation. Number one is going to be, do plants die? And if so, then there may have been death before sin. We'll talk about Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. So we're going to cover those three objections. So let's start with number one. Do plants really die? Well, we see in the Bible, Adam and Eve were eating from plants. They were eating from all the plants in the garden. They were given permission to eat from all the plants except one. Now, the question is, what happens when we dig up plants and eat from them? Well, the answer is, we kill them. They're dead when we dig them up or if we kill, eat all the roots. So does that imply there was some form of death before sin? Well, let me read you a quote from Dr. Hugh Ross. He's got his doctorate in astronomy, and he makes this statement. The death of at least plants or plant parts must have occurred before Adam. Well, he uses that excuse to want to believe in millions and billions of years. In other words, Dr. Ross believes in old, an old earth, and this is one of the texts he uses to support an old earth. Now, here's Richard Deem, who's a research specialist. He states, even grass grazers pull up whole plants, including the roots, on occasion, which results in the death of entire plants. Some animals eat only roots, such as gophers. Once the roots are eaten, the plant quickly dies. So are we implying here that there really was some form of death before sin? Well, let's take a look at this whole issue of do plants die? Now, I'm going to go through five points and then a conclusion on this one issue. The five points will be, were we created to die? Is there a distinction between animal and plant death? Number three, God gave us one rule and a penalty for breaking that rule. Four, we'll take a look at Scripture, sin, and death, that relationship. Five, we'll take a look at, again, Genesis 131. Then we'll draw a conclusion from there. And we'll firmly answer that question, do plants die? So point one, were we created to die? Well, in Genesis 3.22, it teaches that we were not created to die, but were to live forever. Let's take a look what Genesis 3.22 states. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has became, become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and get these words, folks, and live forever. Right there in the Bible, it clearly states we could have lived forever. But today we know that's not true. Why? Well, let's go on and continue with Genesis verses 23 and 24 in chapter 1. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim 
and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. The Bible clearly teaches we were created to live forever, but because of sin, we die. In other words, God drove us out of the Garden of Eden so we could no longer eat from the tree of life. Therefore, we die. So the next time someone asks you the question, why do we die? The answer is very simple, folks. It's because of the original sin by Adam. Which brings us to point two, distinction between animals and plants. The Bible makes a clear distinction here between the status of plants and animals, also man. See, biologically, plants have a cell structure and can die. In the Bible, though, man and animals are given the breath of life, nefesh, or kaya nefesh, which means a living soul. That's in Genesis 2.7. Biblically, plants are never described as having the breath of life. So we see a clear distinction here between animals and plants. People and animals are given the breath of life, but plants are never given the breath of life. Nowhere in the Bible do we ever see plants die. They wither and fade. The only mention of a plant possibly dying is in Job 14.8, and people will use this. However, if we take a Closer look at the full context. Again, we're bringing back that thing called context. That is part of understanding how to interpret God's Word. If we look at the full context of Job 14.8, as we look at verses 7 through 9, it shows the tree is not really dead, but only appears to be. And here's how this reads in the Bible. For there is hope for a tree, when it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and its shoots will not fail. Though its roots grow old in the ground and its stump dies in the dry soil, at the scent of water it will flourish and put forth sprigs like a plant. So it's really not dead. See, plants biblically do not have life, therefore they can't die. And I know that is different from what we learn in the biology classroom, because from a biology classroom we're looking at it purely from a biology or scientific sense because it has a cell. But the Bible never ascribes life to plants. Therefore, there's a difference between plants and people and animals when we're talking about life. So, conclusion on this, there was no death before sin. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have, folks. You can still be wrong, especially when you put man's wisdom above the plain reading of God's word. Now, let's go to point three on do plants die. God gave us one rule. He gave Adam and Eve one rule. Don't eat of the tree of life. He also said, if you break my one rule, there will be a penalty. And what will that penalty be? Death. God gave us a rule. And that brings us right into point four. God kept his promise and death came to all because of one man. The Bible is very clear on this. God gave you one rule. He said, break my rule, you will surely die. Adam and Eve broke the rule, and death came to all. And we see this in Romans 5, 12, where it states, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. We also see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by a man came death. Then in Romans 8, 19, for we know that the whole creation groans, Romans 8, 22, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Two questions about these verses. Do these verses refer to only humans or both humans and animals about death? Question two, does this death refer to just spiritual death or to both spiritual and physical death? We need to dive deeper so we fully understand God's word. Now, Romans 5.12 does refer to human death. However, Romans 8.19 through 22 refers to all of creation coming under the curse, which includes the animals. Therefore, because of sin, death came to all, which includes both humans and animals. We all came under the curse. All of creation was under the curse.
Now in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 19, God decreed that our bodies would return to the dust. You know what that means? Physical death. And that was as a result of sin. This leaves no doubt that physical death was also included for sin and that there was no death before sin. Also in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, we read, But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now what did God mean by die there? If we examine the events of the fall, we find that Adam did immediately die spiritually. But he didn't physically die at that moment when he first ate of that fruit. So are we only talking about spiritual death here? Well, when we take a closer look at the language, see, a more literal translation of the Hebrew words surely die is really dying you will die. That is a more literal translation, dying you will die. The double use of death there indicates the certainty of it. Not that it will happen immediately, but it will happen. Terry Mortensen, with his PhD, makes this statement. The phrase, you shall surely die, can be literally translated from the Hebrew biblical text as dying, you shall die. The grammatical construction is quite common in the Old Testament, not just with the verb, but also with others, and does include or intensify the certainty of the action. So what do we have here? Well, first, Adam was created perfect and sinless. Second, because he was created sinless, he was not originally condemned to physical death. But when Adam ate from the tree, he truly died just as God promised he would. He died spiritually at that moment. But he was also came under the curse with ultimate reality of physical death. So 930 years later, Adam's body finally caught up with the spirit and he physically died. That was all because of sin. See, man is now a fallen sinner under the curse. The last Adam, Jesus, will come to conquer. He came to conquer physical death through his resurrection. If sin was not the cause of death, then why did Jesus have to go to the cross, physically die, and be physically raised from the dead. You see, the Bible's very clear on here. There was no death of any kind before sin. And finally, the Bible does teach that death was actually an intrusion into God's perfect creation. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, where it states, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. This verse teaches that the death of man and the animals was not part of the original creation. And even through death, even though death reigns in this present world, one day in the future, there will be no more death. Isn't that wonderful? We read this in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 4, and it states, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Isn't that comforting? That is something we have to look forward to. Now, the last point, do plants die? Let's take a look at Genesis 1.31. In Genesis 1.31, God proclaims his entire creation very good. How are we to understand the original state of God's creation? And what will God restore everything to in end times if there was already death and decay before sin? Will he restore it back to death and decay? And if sin is not the cause of death, then who or what is? Are we now blaming God for all the death and not sin? The only conclusion we have, folks, based on the Bible and the consistency of Scripture, is that there was no form of death before sin. Well, let's turn to our second topic now. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Let's see what it has to say there. 
These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, you notice the word day there, in the day. This is commonly used to support that the days of creation in Genesis 1 did not have to be literal 24-hour periods. See, in this case, the word day in Genesis 2-4 does not really mean a literal day. It can refer to the entire creation week. However, in the context that is used is what we call a Hebrew idiom, meaning when. So in the day really means when. Now, what is an idiom? It's a word or phrase that is not meant to be taken literally. Also in here, we don't have a number of the word day, and it is not bound by evening and morning. Notice there's a difference between the word day here and what we find in Genesis chapter 1. Now, Jim Brenneman, a biblical, he's a biblical Hebrew and biblical archaeology instructor, states this. In the day, as used in the words of Genesis 2 verse 4, is a common idiom throughout the Hebrew Old Testament and it does not meet the criteria of grammar to mean a rotational day, meaning literal day. This usage of yom, in yom is the Hebrew word for day, so this usage of yom in 2.4 is simply meaning at the time, or on the occasion, or when. We must understand the language sometimes to get a clearer meaning of what God is telling us. Jason Lyle, Ph.D. in Astrophysics states, even if, as some theologians allege, yom can mean a period of time longer than 24 hours when used as part of a prepositional phrase like the day of the Lord, this has no bearing on how the word yom should be interpreted in other words, in other contexts. In Genesis 2-4, the word day is part of a prepositional phrase and, according to some scholars, does not mean a literal day. We have to get back to our hermeneutics. Even if it doesn't mean a little day, and it does not mean a little day in Genesis 2-4, we cannot use that to force an interpretation of what we read in Genesis chapter 1. Hermeneutics says we are to interpret the word based on the context where it is used, not somewhere else. So we need to practice good scholarship when using God's word. Conclusion. Genesis 2-4 cannot be used to support the days of creation for long ages. So again, people are misusing God's word. Now let's go to our last topic. The Hebrew language is poetic, and therefore Genesis 1 should not be taken literally. This comes out of what we call the framework hypothesis, which is simply an attempt to reclassify the language of Genesis 1 as being something other than historical narrative. It starts with the view that the days of creation in Genesis 1 are symbolic expressions, meaning poetic that have nothing to do with time. I'd like to go through three evidences that can be used to demonstrate that Genesis chapter 1 is clearly written in the narrative form, meaning real history, and not in poetic form. These three will be the arrangement of the language components, something called Hebrew parallelism, and then the New Testament. So evidence one, language components. Now in English, we are what we call a subject-verb-object language. In other words, when we write a sentence, we typically put the subject first, then the verb, then the object. So there's our quick little lesson in grammar there. English, we are a subject-verb-object language. Other languages use different orders. Some can use a combination. For example, Spanish can be subject-verb-object or it can be written verb-subject-object. However, when we translate Spanish to English, we always put it in the order we read in English. Subject first, then the verb, then the object. The Hebrew language can also be written in two formats. It can be subject, verb, object in order, or the order can go verb, subject, object. What's the difference? Well, in a Hebrew sentence, if it starts with the subject, then goes the verb, then the object, that is predominantly poetic style writing in the Hebrew language. However, if the verb comes first, then the subject, then the object, that is generally narrative in form. Now, how is Genesis 1 written? Well, the literal translation, before we move anything around, reads this way. In the beginning, created God the heavens. Well, notice, created is first, that is the verb. God comes next, that is the subject. Then heavens is the object. In other words, Genesis is written 
in verb subject object format, which is narrative, not poetic. Now, Charles Taylor, who has a PhD in linguistics, is also professor of theology, states this. Genesis chapter 1 was written in the Hebrew language, which is consistent in using one structure for narrative and quite a different one for poetry. Hebrew poets like David in the Psalms use subject, verb, object, structure like English. In general, then, if the Hebrew goes verb, subject, object, it will be narrative. Genesis chapter 1 is written in the verb, subject, object. It is meant to be taken as narrative. Evidence two here, Hebrew parallelism. Well, let's talk about poetry. English poetry is is defined by, a lot of times, pronounced sounds, identifying text as poetry. For example, we routinely use words that rhyme. That is characteristic of English poetry, rhyming. However, Hebrew poetry does not use that format. A common literary feature of Hebrew poetry in the Old Testament is called parallelism. In this case, two, the words of two or more lines of text are directly related in some way. For example, Psalm chapter 24, verse 3, we read, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Those two statements relate to each other. That is an example of Hebrew parallelism or poetic style of writing. This poetic structure, that style, is not found in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is written in historical narrative format. Therefore, we should take Genesis 1 as real history. Dr. Stephen Boyd, who has his PhD in the Hebrew language and cognate studies, also a professor of Old Testament and Semitic languages, makes this statement. My findings in this step were the probability that Genesis 1-1 through 2-3 is narrative is between. Now, let me read these numbers. Here's this probability numbers. That it's, that it's narrative is, is point nine 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 four two and point nine 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 eight seven At a 99.5% confidence level, I conclude, therefore, that it is statistically indefensible to argue that this text is poetry. He has done a complete study on verb forms and language for Genesis 1 and has come up to the conclusion that this is narrative, not poetry. James Johnson has his doctorate of law and also a doctorate in theology, so he understands how to think here. And he states, the bottom line is that Genesis is not Hebrew poetry. Genesis is is Hebrew narrative prose. In other words, Genesis is a record of accurate, true history. And this is not a minor issue because Paul hung his theology of our salvation in Christ upon the historicity of the Genesis record. Wow. And then finally, Edward Young, Ph.D. in Old Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary, he taught Old Testament theology for 30 years, makes this statement. Genesis 1 is not poetry or saga or myth, but straightforward, trustworthy history. And inasmuch as it is a divine revelation, accurately records those matters of which it speaks. Now, let's get to evidence three on poetry. The New Testament. The New Testament treats Genesis 1 through 11 as historical narrative. You see, there are at least 25 New Testament passages which refer directly to the early chapters of Genesis, and they always are treated as real history. So what's our conclusion here, folks? We must be good stewards of God's Word. Genesis 1 is real history. The days were literal days. There's nothing in the Bible that treats these words in Genesis 1, the word day, as long ages. It is not found in the Bible. People are using outside information, their understanding of the scientific evidence, to force an interpretation onto God's Word. In a previous session, we said we are not supposed to add to God's Word. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 kind of wraps this piece up, and it states, As a result, we are no longer to be children, 
tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. We need to trust God's word for how he gave it to us and stop twisting it around. Well, you've been listening to Defending the Faith. I'm your host, Mike Riddle. We always enjoy hearing from our listeners. Send your comments and questions to info at creationtraining.org. If you have something that's bothering you about creation evolutionists, give us an email. That's info, I-N-F-O, at creationtraining.org. Now, we're also supported by your donations. If this teaching has been helpful to you, we please prayerfully consider sending a donation to CTI, that's Creation Training Initiative, CTI, Post Office Box 2415, Eagle, Idaho, 83616. That's Post Office Box 2415, Eagle, Idaho, 83616. Or you can go to our website, creationtraining.org, and donate online. And don't forget, in the beginning, God created. That's all for today's show. Defending the Faith airs each Saturday at noon right here on KBXL 941 The Voice. For more teachings and resources, visit creationtraining.org or the program archive page on 941thevoice.com.